Hello, thank you for watching this uh, recorded lecture for the day that I'm on jury duty. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the brain. We're moving up from the spinal cord into this central control system, this um, exaggerated, folded up um, expansion of the top of our spinal cord. So the brain is divided into several pieces. We have the cerebral hemispheres, which are what we mostly think of when we think of the brain, the big processing areas. Um, these do all of our higher thinking. We have the diencephalon, which has our limbic system and a lot of other sort of central stuff. We have the cerebellum, uh, which is important for coordination and posture. And then we have the brain stem with the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So before we get into too much detail, I want to go over some general stuff and some terminology. When we look at the brain, so here we're looking at a cross section of the brain, uh, we're going to see first areas of gray matter and areas of white matter. Now, hopefully you remember that that white matter is myelinated axons and the gray matter is cell bodies. You'll notice when you look at this that most of the gray matter is right around the very, very edge of the brain. That's where those cell bodies are. And the white matter is in the center where all of those cell bodies are connecting to each other and connecting down into the spinal cord. We also have a few important um, pieces of terminology here. We have fissures, which are um, it, it, like invaginations that go deep into the brain. We have gyri and sulci. So gyri are places where the little bulb out of the brain, a little fold out, and sulci are places where it folds in. We have uh, ventricles, which are areas where the cerebrospinal fluid is, um, big areas. There's lots of smaller areas, but the ventricles are the big ones. Um, we have tracts. Which, are area, which you should recognize that term from the spinal cord, areas of white matter that are running all together in a particular location. And then we have nuclei. Nuclei is a really, really overloaded word in science, unfortunately. Um, I know you've encountered the nuclei of cells before. You've probably encountered the nuclei of atoms. This time we're talking about something completely different. Nuclei in the brain are just really dense areas of gray matter, basically really dense areas of cell bodies with a particular function. And we're going to see them in several different parts of the brain. Now, you should all remember the, these um, meninges surrounding the brain, the dura mater on the outside, the pia mater resting right on top of the brain, and the arachnoid mater in between. Now, this is all really important to protect the brain, but of course, like every form of protection, this can go wrong. One of the common problems here is a hematoma, which just means a bleed somewhere in these menin in or around these meninges. And we can either have a, an epidural hematoma, which means on top of the dura, so it's up on top of the dura that the blood is leaking, or a subdural hematoma, which means it's bleeding into that arachnoid mater um, under the dura mater. Obviously, when it's in below the dura mater, it's much closer to the brain. It's a lot more dangerous. The other problem that we can have is concussion. So remember, I said on Monday that the brain is basically floating on a waterbed and that is the fluid in the arachnoid mater. Um, when a strong enough impact hits the outside of the skull, the brain can bounce hard enough that it bounces through that little thin waterbed in the arachnoid mater and hits the dura mater and the skull, um, and it gets bruised, it gets damaged. From, in general, we heal pretty well from a single concussion unless it's fairly extreme, given enough time to recover, we'll heal just fine from it. However, repeated concussions 
can cause serious buildup of brain damage and Ill inability to heal from it. Uh, and the problem is that we experience a lot of minor concussions that we don't necessarily think of as concussions, a lot of minor brain trauma. Um, this is obviously particularly common for people who play um, high impact sports and things like that. Um, football is the most obvious. Uh, boxing is also pretty obvious, but uh, they're ha finding this in soccer. When people headbutt the ball, it's still causing these sorts of mi mini concussions that when they get repeated over and over can wind up with serious brain damage. All right, so moving on from this, we move into you know, one more thing before we get to the brain itself, and that's these ventricles. So these ventricles are full of cerebrospinal fluid, and we have the lateral ventricles that come in together to the third ventricle, down into the fourth ventricle, and then into the central canal, which actually runs through the spinal cord. And this cerebrospinal fluid is constantly circulating here um, as the circulatory system of the brain. Remember, the brain doesn't have blood in it. There's that blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier has these astrocyte feet lining all of these blood vessels. So nothing is getting directly into the brain. And so that circulatory system of the cerebrospinal fluid has to carry uh, oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the brain. There is one exception to this blood-brain barrier, which is the hypothalamic pituitary portal. The hypothalamic pituitary portal does allow one place where blood has access to the brain. This is because the hypothalamus and pituitary release hormones into the blood and get signals from hormones that are circulating in the blood. So that has to be able to exchange uh, with the brain. This is really important for the connection between our nervous control system and our hormonal control system, which we'll start learning about next semester. Um, but it is also a point of danger. It is a common way that infections get access to the brain. In fact, um, HIV, for example, forms a reservoir in the brain, and it is suspected that this is how HIV gets into the brain. Um, so that is a common problem, but we need access to allow that hormonal exchange. So back to the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, the cerebrospinal fluid surrounds our brain, surrounds our brain and the arachnoid matter is in the ventricles, is in the spinal cord, and it needs to circulate through all of this. So cerebrospinal fluid is produced um, at the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle uh, from the blood. It circulates in down into the third and fourth ventricles and into the spinal cord, and it also circulates throughout the arachnoid mater in that subarachnoid space um, throughout the brain and spinal cord. And it is in that um, uh, subarachnoid space that it is absorbed into arachnoid villi and then back into the bloodstream. So there's a constant exchange of fluid with the bloodstream, but in this very controlled way as cerebrospinal fluid. All right, moving on from some of these basic structures and looking at overall, we're gonna focus in really heavily on particular structures in the brain. We're gonna start from the bottom. So the medulla oblongata is this really base brain area that controls a lot of absolute core functions of our body. So it's cardiovascular centers setting things like our heartbeat um, and those sorts of functions. We have respiratory rhythmicity centers setting our, uh, the pattern of our breathing. So these very sort of base functions. We also have relay stations that transmit signals from our spinal cord to our brain and back down. Moving up, we have the pons. The pons, a lot of this is more ascending and descending tracks, just stuff moving through. We also have 
the uh, some respiratory controls in here, the pneumotaxic center, the apneustic center. Anytime you see that pneumo, you should be thinking about lungs um, and breathing. So this is about breathing control, but we're also, again, mostly seeing that stuff going directly through it, going up or going down. Uh, we all, when, then we get to the mesencephalon. This has um, a number of nuclei in it. If you remember that nuclei term, we have the red nucleus, which is red because, it, and it is physically red if you look at a slice. It is red because it's full of little tiny blood vessels. We have the substantia nigra. We've got a bunch of these little control centers in these nuclei um, for some you know, fundamental functions here. We move into the diencephalon, which is really just transmission here. We're seeing the optic tra transmission, we're seeing transmission up into the thalamus. Um, so a lot of you know basic transmission through the body, brain. But then this thalamus, this thalamus is really important. We're going to start with the epithalamus, which is on the thalamus. We have the pineal gland, which is important hormonally. Um, this becomes part of our um, limbic system. The thalamus uh, is sort of a, a signal center, a control center. It sends signal. It's a, a relay station. It sends signals out and takes signals in um, from different parts of the body, sort of organizing control. So we have... A lot of a lot of different sensory stimulus is going through here. So um, auditory stimuli come through here on the way to the auditory cortex, visual stimuli to the visual cortex, etc. And we also have the anterior area that is basically part of our limbic system, part of our emotional system. So that limbic system that we're going to keep talking about is the emotional control center. We'll talk a lot more about that in just a moment. So this is sort of a relay station sending everything to different out to different areas. Now, coming into this limbic system, this emotional control system, we reach the hypothalamus. So hopefully you remember from a few slides back that the hypothalamus is um, part of our brain, it's also part of our hormonal system, part of our endocrine system. So this is an area, basically the control center, the nervous system control center for our endocrine system. Lots of hormones are either sent directly from the hypothalamus or controlled by signals from the hypothalamus. And this hormonal system is a big part of how our Hormones and our emotions affect each other. We also have the pituitary gland coming off of this, which is a, a neurohormonal gland, so a, a nervous system gland that is producing hormones. Um, and some of those are hormones sent directly from the hypothalamus. Some of them are signaled to be sent by the hypothalamus, but this is a very connected set of signals coming in here. Now, moving down from here, we reach the cerebellum. The cerebellum is important for posture. It's important for gait. It's important for balance. It's important for a lot of this sort of big control that you don't need to think about. So if you want to stand up from your chair and walk across the room, you're not carefully thinking about how do I balance, how do I move every muscle, you're just thinking, I'm going to stand up and walk over across the room. Um, and everything else is coordinated, some of it by your cerebellum, some of it by other coordination areas, but the posture, the balance, and the basic gait is happening in the cerebellum. All right, so we've talked about the sort of brain stem, we've talked about the cerebellum. Now we finally move into the cerebrum. When we think about the brain, we picture this walnut thing that is our cerebrum, our cerebral hemispheres. And this is, in fact, the largest part of our brain in humans. That's not true in all species or even in all mammals. Um, but it's very large, and very important for us. And it has these different lobes 
with names that should look familiar, the frontal lobe, named after the frontal bone, parietal lobe after the parietal bone, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Uh, and all of these gyri, these pieces that stick out, and sulci, pieces that go in. Uh, and it's the, this folded thing on the outside of our brain. And it's divided into the two cerebral hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, which we'll talk more about in a moment. You'll notice there's this fissure, the longitudinal fissure running down, dividing them mostly in half. So these four cerebral lobes named after the bones of the skull, um, each of them have somewhat different functions. So the frontal lobe is important for thinking, memory, behavior, and movement, the parietal lobe, dealing with a lot of language and touch. When we get into sensory and movement coordination, we'll, you'll hear more details about some of that. The temporal lobe is about hearing, learning, and feelings. The occipital lobe is about sight. Um, and really most of our sight processing is happening there, and that's really most of what that's devoted to. So different things are happening in each of these. Now what's interesting is, the way we learned about these is almost all because something goes wrong. Basically, if there's damage to one of these lobes in a particular area, we can figure out what problems the person is having and see, well, okay, if they were got damage in this particular spot and now they have aphasia, they've lost words, well, I guess that's a word area. And so that's, in fact, exactly how we have found the functions of these places. And these different pieces, figuring out people who had lesions had problems in particular areas of the brain. So I said it's divided into hemispheres. Now, we hear a lot about this sort of left brain, right brain thing, and it's very exaggerated in pop science. There is a difference. There are differences between the hemispheres, but they're not as big as it's sort of made out to be. In general, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa, and also gets the signals from that side of the body. Um, and there are some differences. For example, our speech centers are focused on the left side of the brain. Um, and along with our general interpretation of language and mathematical calculations. Whereas on the right side, we have analysis by touch and spatial visualization. Now there's sort of been this like creative versus logical and, and that just doesn't really map out the way that people want it to. Um, you do have a dominant hemisphere if you are right-handed your dominant hemisphere is almost certainly your left hemisphere. If you are left-handed, um, it actually can go both ways. Sometimes it really is the right hemisphere. Sometimes it's actually still the left hemisphere. We don't quite understand what's going on there. Um, but if you're right-handed, it's definitely your, your left hemisphere is dominant. But that doesn't necessarily mean all the functions in there are dominant in your personality or interests or your behaviors. It just means that that one's more developed for movement control and things like that. And all of this is connected by the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is very dense white matter tract. If you remember from that picture, it's like almost glowing white. Um, so there's white matter tracts running between these, keeping your brain connected and functioning as one organism. If this is split, you can behave normally in most ways, but literally the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. The two sides of the brain aren't talking to each other. And that can result in some really weird and actually really cool um, differences in how people function. People do live without a corpus callosum. It is possible. It just changes some things. So... Moving in, there's a few other pieces we need to talk about, which are these um, basal nuclei and a little more on the limbic system. So these basal nuclei are important for a lot of 
like low level control and emotional control. We talked about some of this. We've got the caudate nucleus, which is a big part of the limbic system, and the amygdala, which is um, sometimes referred to as the fear center. It um, mediates fear response and a lot of other sort of associated negative responses. And this, you know, all together, we look at the limbic system. So the limbic system, we have the amygdala, which is emotions, and particularly a lot of those negative emotions like fear. Um, we have the septum, which is important for pleasure and reproduction. We have the cingulate cortex, which is important for pain and visceral responses. Um, and one thing you'll notice if you're looking at this, you also see the hippocampus is here um, in the limbic system, uh, closely connected to that amygdala. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the course, I told you I am intentionally going to keep you a little bit outside of your comfort zone because that's where you learn best, when you're a little outside of your comfort zone. This is why. When the amygdala is a little bit stimulated, you're getting the signal that things are a little off, I'm nervous, I'm a little anxious, I need to pay attention. And you remember things much better when your amygdala is weakly stimulated. When your amygdala is very strongly stimulated, then you can't remember anything. It's very hard to make new memories in extreme situations like that. Uh, so, you know, that, that sort of optimal state for stimulation. The other thing you'll notice is that the olfactory bulb runs right into this area, which is why, you know, if you smell like something your mom used to make for special occasions, or you smell um, your former partner's perfume or anything like that, it'll send you, it'll, you know, immediately connect very strongly to both the memory and these emotional responses, because that olfactory connection is very, very strong. So that's sort of the overview of the limbic system, all of this emotional response and everything that's connected to it. And that's this overview of these different parts of the brain. Now, one thing that I do want you to be thinking about is how do we test whether parts of the brain are working, whether there's something wrong. And that's this neurological exam. And you've read about the central nervous system neurological exam. We'll talk more about the details in the peripheral neurological exam later after this, ex this class exam. Um, but for the case study that you'll be working on, um, do be thinking about this neurological exam and how um, the neurological exam tests things. And that's something that, that's going to be relevant for your case study and how these pieces all tie together. Um, just as a quick reminder, the case study is due Friday night. So if you have any questions about the materials that we've covered or about the case study itself, you can always email me. I will be trying to help. And if I don't get called for jury duty or I go out there and they don't select me for a jury, I will come back. I'll be available on Wednesday. I'll send out an email to the class as soon as I know whether I will be on campus Wednesday. I'm hoping I'll be around and able to help out, but I can't promise it. So, um, if you have any questions, do email me and I'll be happy to help you. And thank you for listening.